Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to today's session. Um, in our last session, we actually discussed uh, Tendulkar's play, uh, Silence the Court is in Session, which was uh, written and published in 1967. And uh, we saw how uh, uh, it's a play on the dramatization of patriarchy, patriarchal uh, social and sexual mores, and the way uh, a young uh, school teacher, uh, Ms. Benare, becomes a, a victim of this uh, patriarchal drama, uh, even as she tries to actually uh, uh, aggress and transgress the sexual mores of a community. Right? And as uh, the theatre critic uh, Shomik Bondopadhyay says correctly, that it is part of Tendulkar's dramatic strategy that Benares immediate prosecutors, uh, persecutors in the play are as powerless as she. And we saw this that in the play, the other characters in the play besides Miss Binare are actually quite helpless and uh, and and uh, and in some sense struggling to uh, make ends meet. Um, they ha they're all uh, amateur actors. Many of them are uh, you know inter inter intermediate failed. Some is a one of them is a pretentious lawyer and so on. Right. So they're all very insecure characters. Um, so. It is part of Tendulkar's dramatic strategy that Benares' immediate persecutors in the play are as powerless as she. And all their exertions to cut Benare down to size are more, they are striving after power than a real exercise of power. So we also see how they project their own insecurities, their own desires and fantasies onto Miss Benare. And they make her the object of their insecurity. So um, as a matter of fact, Tendulkar's plays at considerable length on the individual powerlessness of each of her assailants, each of them grabbing every opportunity to expose or humiliate another and ganging up only to attack Benare, in the process exposing their own powerlessness and their desperate need to assume a pretense of power in the collective. So this is a quote from uh, Shomik Bondabadda's introduction to the plays. Now, uh, Let's move on to another uh, similar play uh, in the sense that it, uh, it um, overlaps with uh, Silence the Court is in Session in terms of again uh, its um, critique uh, of and its satir satir satirizing of uh, certain institutional forms of power of uh, sexual mores um, and, uh, you know, and this plays a specific fo focus on uh, sexuality. So the name of the play is A Friend's Story, right? And uh, it's, uh, it was one of um, Tendulkar's uh, uh, plays that was long in the making. I think uh, he writes about his play in uh, the preface to the translation of his collected plays, where he talks about uh, you know, how uh, this play came to be. And this is what he says uh, about here, the first germ, uh, where the first germ for the play uh, came, right, came from. Um, I was in my teens, uh, this is Tendulkar speaking, I was in my teens when the woman who became Mitra in a friend's story came into my life. This was in the early 1940s. We lived in Pune then. My elder sister took me to a play staged on the annual day celebrations of her college. The performance was at night and she took me as her escort, since young girls were not supposed to be out alone at that time. The play was a melodrama and all the characters, both male and female, were played by women students. Mitra played an old man. Hers was a strong character in the play. Upright, aggressive, plain speaking and manly even at his age. A woman playing a man role, a male role, is generally greeted by college students with cat calls, derisive laughter and naughty remarks. She looks like a woman despite all efforts to conceal her feminine attributes, such as long hair and breasts, 
was also her voice and manner. Not so when Mitra appeared on the stage as an outspoken, manly old man. Of course, the students knew her as one of them, a woman student, and must have been ready to greet her with the choicest of dirty remarks. But when Mitra made her entry, there was respectful silence among the audience. To my amazement, she looked like a man, and an old man at that, though not as old as a character in the play. Her youth showed through, but the voice was gruff and throaty. The face looked rugged with a white moustache and makeup. The gait and manner were unmistakably masculine. This is my first memory of her. I remembered that I had seen her many times before, riding a cycle to her college. She used to wear a white sari, a plain borderless blouse with a collar, and white tennis shoes, not chapels. She never wore any colours. She appeared tall for a woman, and her frame lacked feminine curves. On or off the cycle, she was erect and manly. Her appearance on the stage, therefore, was not only convincing, but awe-inspiring at the first, very first glance. Her performance that night made a deep impact on my juvenile mind. Not the play, but Mitra's performance. This performance remained with me. Later, my sister gave me some information about Mitra's background and family. Mitra became a real character in my mind and remained so, a female who was so very much like a male. Many years after that, I had a new friend who was older than me. He was an actor. In the course of our long conversations, he mentioned Mitra. She had been his friend during their college days. He used to act in plays with an all-male cast at annual days in college, and Mitra used to play the male in plays with an all-female cast. My actor friend helped Mitra in situations which she had shared only with him. I was keen to hear him talk about her. She was still to be seen in Pune. I came to know about him from a trait in her that I had not heard of before. She had a craving for a girl and had an affair with her which ended up in a major crisis for Mitra. It practically finished her life. I still remember the shock waves and the confusion produced in my young mind. I had just begun my career in writing then, but what I heard about Mitra did not prompt me to write about her at once. It took me some years to surface in the form of a short story. It was written in the mid-50s, with the same structure as the play written years later. The title was Mitra. It appeared in one of the, the Diwali annuals in Marathi and was appreciated. It was a story of relationship between a boy who had just touched 20 and a slightly older young woman who fascinates and frightens him at the same time. The boy is the narrator. It is his experience. The thought of writing and staging a play on a same-sex relationship was out of the question. Yet the play Mitra materialized. Out of some compulsion, which had no logic, it grew in spite of the near impossibility of a play on a lesbian being staged, let alone seen by traditional Marathi audiences. The play got written in spite of me. It was staged by a group of youngsters. It did not have a run only a few shows which were hated by the women and sneered at by the men in the audience. So this is what Tendulkar has to say about the early story that he wrote on uh, which then became uh, this play much later on. So the story itself as uh, Tendulkar's own quotation suggests is about a woman uh, named uh, Sumitra who is called Mitra in the play who has uh, uh, an intense infatuation for another woman called Nama. Namrata. And uh, the narrator of the story of the play is this man called Bapu. He's called Bapu. Um, and he is a young uh, uh, bachelor's of arts uh, undergraduate. And uh, he is studying in college. His actual name is uh, Srikanth Marathi, but he's called um, Bapu. And Bapu, the stage directions say that he's anywhere between 18 and 30 years old. He looks younger than he actually is. He's seen talking to himself. Slowly, he begins to address an audience. So what happens in this play is that it's formally organized around Bapu as a narrator who narrates what's, go what's, what's been happening and what will happen in the play. And he constantly steps in and out of his role as a narrator. On one hand, he's a narrator. On the other hand, he is also uh, a fellow actor. So if you look at uh, the way the play opens, it begins with uh, Bapu's um, 
narration and right? he kind of uh, uh, he introduces the other main protagonist of the play which is sumitra right so the entire play revolves around uh, sumitra uh, her rather manipulative uh, relationship with bapu bapu's love and fear and fascination for sumitra and later on his hatred for sumitra uh, because he realizes that despite his love and compassion for her uh, she manipulates him and she takes advantage of him and uh, she, and he she is he is the only one to whom she actually comes out as a woman who likes or desires other women right so um but uh, it's only till the very end of the play that uh, uh sumitra actually exposes her vulnerability but until then sumitra is a very uh, you know um, hot headed um, independent fiercely independent uh, woman who doesn't trust anyone who doesn't rely on anyone she uh, feels that she's been completely rejected by society but she is uh, determined to make her way through without uh, depending on anybody else right so she has this fierce sense of individu- individuality but we get to know also in the play that this uh, outward apparent sense of um, independence uh, actually uh, thinly veils uh, a deep sense of hurt and uh, misery and insecurity uh, the other characters uh, in the play are uh, is nama nama who is uh, sumitra's uh, i mean uh, beloved and um, you have manya dalvi manya dalvi is uh, nama's boyfriend Uh, also a college going student pande is uh, bapu's roommate and uh, so you just have about five uh, characters in the play right and uh, the entire play is framed by bapu's narration as he steps in and out of his role as a narrator so he narrates this particular incident he steps back he participates in the action that he has just narrated uh, it could be a flashback or it's something that uh uh is going to happen right so to open with bapu's lines um bapu says and this is how the what has transpired so far in the play and uh, the character of sumitra is introduced you can't tell a love story in a dispassionate voice even as you as you narrate it it becomes your own why does it happen why do we live through somebody else's love story as if it were our own Why do we go through death when they die? This is Mitra's love story. Mitra, Sumitra, Sumitra Dev. Sumitra was not related to me in any way. She was my friend, friend. Why? Can't you have a woman for a friend? Sumitra was my friend. I was in my first year in college when Sumitra came from elsewhere and joined as a second year BA student. She was different from all the other girls, or so I thought. The other girls were the helpless touch me not kind but there was a masculine vigor in Sumitra Dev's stride and speech she was carefree her laughter came in loud bursts she had eyes which met you in straight combat her broad forehead suggested intelligence her entire personality had a natural aggressive masculinity but with a figure irresistibly attractive to men she was an instant hit with the students mitra singh needs tried to grab chances for lessons exchanging lessons and notes with her sorry nerds tried to grab chances for exchanging lessons and notes with her the scams would stand in scattered groups to whistle at her and pass snide remarks i i was neither scholar nor sp- nor sportsman i did not have the guts to become a champ i had absolutely no interest in politics no professor could have recalled my name without some effort I was one of the crowd who entered college solely for filling the benches in the in the classroom. I had just one special trait, an inferiority complex. How could I hope to get anywhere near Sumitra? I couldn't even dream of engaging her in conversation. Strangely enough, that's the way it turned out. So, in the initial opening lines of Bapu, you realize that he is not a very conventional man. Right? He is not a sportsman. he's not a scholar he doesn't have guts he says he has no courage to to resist resist or rebel and uh, he feels that he's just there in 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 college to fill the classroom um he also feels extremely insecure around sumitra because sumitra seems supremely confident 
there is something uh, very, uh, there's an actual aggressive masculinity to this woman, which uh, other men try, find irresistible. So it's, um, and it's very interesting that Bapu and the other men in the story, especially uh, Pandey, uh, are uh, irresistibly drawn to uh, Mitra precisely because she's not one of those docile, uh, touch me not girls. Right? She is, she's very confident, she's very outgoing which these men misunderstand as a sign of sexual availability. Um, then uh, Bapu discovers a photograph of Sumitra Dev, which he uh, found on the floor. And uh, he is very anxious that um, other people, other men may, may discover this photograph. And so he is very concerned about Sumitra's reputation. So he went, to the, he went to his room and he looked at the, he gazed at the photograph for ages and he was surprised and repulsed by turns, he says. Is she a woman art at all? Look at that dress. And who are those hairy, bare-chested men with cigarettes in their mouths? Right, so this, she, she, he sees hairy, bare-chested men with cigarettes standing behind um, um, Sumitra in the photograph. Right? So there is this very ambiguous response of disgust, uh, repulsion, and fascination with a woman who is not a conventional woman. Um, but Sumitra is least concerned with this. She, is not really, she doesn't really care that he has discovered a photograph of her. Then when Sumitra speaks later on, she says, she introduces herself to Bapu saying, we lived in Sangli when I was a child. There was a family called Marathe in the opposite house. They had a son. I used to play dodgeball with him. I would hit him every time. He would never dodge the ball. When he got hit too often, he'd go home running, crying for his mother. My mother used to say, I had hoodwinked God to be born a girl. I was always with the boys, used to play all their games from marbles to gilly danda, even kabaddi. It was great fun. Can you swim, Bapu? No. Bapu, who's embarrassed, says, no, I was something of a weakling, you know. My mother would not let me go anywhere near the river. So you see an interesting ironic contrast between Bapu, who is not a conventional man, who is not into physical sports, and he's not an athletic person. But Sumitra is someone who always remembers playing with boys. She hardly ever uh, was with girls. And her mother thought that uh, mother had tricked her uh, into being born as a girl. So. We, we, that's, that's an initial impression of uh, this woman who swims, who plays tennis, and so on and so forth. And then um, there is this other passage later on in the play where uh, Bapu uh, suggests his love for her. He realizes that he is, uh, so he is not able to suppress it. He says to the audience, Bapu says, when you see a person for the first time, you form a certain impression. It changes when you actually meet that person. It changes to something quite different from what it was at first. Not entirely different, but more real. It was in this sense that Mitra began to seem more true and real to me. I don't know why, but I felt a little closer to her. In college, I never thrust myself to her notice. But one day, she herself called out to me in the corridor, Bapu, see me this evening. I have a job for you. I did manage to say yes, my heart racing madly. I felt I would burst in my efforts to control it. For a long time, I felt the other students burning with envy. Right? So he, he, he has this uh, unspoken uh, love for Sumitra. Right? But Sumitra is not concerned. She is not concerned. She's quite in, indifferent to Bapu's feelings. And uh, she's never, she never shows herself as someone who is uh, she never exposes herself for uh, her vulnerabilities. Right? So she, she seems rather inaccessible and emotionally distant. Um, later on, we also get a sense of Bapu, of Sumitra's sense of isolation. She does feel isolated. She feels that she has no one. Right? And it's, it's, uh, she also says that, um, and she doesn't immediately confess to Bapu about her sexual orientation. But then she just uh, suggests, uh, you know, that she uh, doesn't know why she's been made the way she has. And uh, she wonders why she is the way she is. And why do we become our own slaves, she says, right? she asks. So 
she's unable. She, she tries to actually develop a close connection with Bapu, but then Bapu isn't able to quite understand what she wants. Right? Uh, she was, there's a scene where Sumitra holds, uh, grabs hold of Bapu's hand and uh, and squeezes it, but then uh, Bapu is not able to uh, interpret this touch. Um, he just hopes that perhaps uh, she's also in love with him. Later on, we also discover that Sumitra had attempted suicide. Um, so the play goes back and forth in time. I mean, there are times when it, there's a flashback after she's heartbroken when Nama does not accept her uh, romantic uh, advances and she tries to commit suicide, but then she fails. And uh, Bapu gets to know and then he, he recounts that to the audience. And then she also, Sumitra also suffers the stigma of attempted suicide. I mean, everyone in the college looks at her strangely and oddly. Later on, uh, in the act, first act, Sumitra also betrays her sexual orientation to Bapu and she tells him a story about herself. Right? So this is what Sumitra has to say about her life and this is she insinuates about her own life. She says the elders in the family got angry with her but the girl didn't care. When she came of age rather early, they got worried. They became very strict. What will people say? Was the bugbear they set up to control her? They sought to stamp her mind with the fear of men. At a time, she didn't know why men were dangerous. Those who made the rules were men themselves. Father, grandfather, weren't they men? Why were they at her constantly? She followed their rules without protest. Then they fenced her in. She found it very difficult to live in the world that of closed, enclosed pens, but she did. Hey, are you listening? Then later she says, well, pretty soon everyone decided their darling girl had to be fixed up with a decent boy. They tried hard, created opportunities for them to meet. Evenings were set aside for this. A gentle force was exerted. The girl obeyed orders. Then she later on goes on to say, the girl went on doing this, knowing fully well that she yearned for the company of men, but not for that kind of relationship. When she met that boy, she felt no physical thrill, no flutter of excitement. Her heart didn't miss, miss a single beat, but the boy felt it all and took it for granted that the girl did too. She found the whole thing rather bizarre. She asked herself why she didn't feel the way other girls did. Why did I feel so completely at home in the company of men? Why did I never feel shy? Why did I feel so much at ease in putting my hand around their shoulders? Why did I find it strange when I sensed a man's excitement? Men were good company, but their, way, their ways with men, women seemed weird and unpleasant. Then later on, she continues saying, um, she hasn't told anyone about it, only you. Don't know why. But I'll tell you the crazy thing she did. There was a servant in the house. He had been with the family a long time. He had shown an interest in the girl several times in a way that only the girl could see. A girl is a girl after all. You know what I mean. He was like that. So this is what Sumitra confesses to Bapu, that she is a woman who discovered uh, that she was confined to the house uh, soon after she matured, physically matured. Then her family used that as an excuse to keep her at home. And she was wondering why the men in the family make the rules for everyone. And then she, they, her family fixed her up with a man in marriage. But she realized that from her childhood, she only she really enjoyed the company of men, but only as friends. She never had any kind of a sexual desire for them, but she was drawn to other girls. And she wondered why she wasn't like other girls. Uh, and um, she wondered why she didn't feel excited by the presence of men. And later on, she tries to have this, uh, this uh, uh, I mean, she, she leads on a male servant at the house, but then uh, nothing ever comes out of it, right? So uh, she realized that she could never become a man's partner. And in the midst of this story, she also lights a cigarette, right? So the, the whole uh, act of smoking becomes an act of masculinity for Mitra in the play. And Bapu, of course, is very uh, disappointed, but he is not entirely hostile or disgusted. He listens to her. He seems to have, uh, seems to feel some compassion for this woman. But at the same time, he also tries to convince her to, to change, to become like other normal, normative women. Right? 
Um, and then later on, uh, we in the towards the end of the first act, we discover that Bapu's roommate Pandey, who is who has been appointed as the secretary of the drama committee, um, has uh, you know uh, has been asked by the principal of the college to perform two plays: one with an all male cast and one with an all female cast. And they, they, the principal does not want boys and girls to act together. So in the all-female play, uh, he makes uh, um, uh, Sumitra play the male role. So he, they want a hefty woman who can play the male role. And after he watches Pandey, after Pandey watches Sumitra acting in the play, he's completely besotted by Sumitra and her masculinity. It's very fascinating and interesting that all the men in the in the play who are fascinated and drawn towards Sumitra are drawn to her because she is not a normative, normal, feminine woman. Right? It's because of her masculinity that uh, so the men are drawn to the masculinity in this woman, right? And it's not to her femininity. Uh, so that is what they find uh, attractive. Okay, and. Um, Towards the end of the first act, we also see Sumitra um, confessing her feelings for Nama, right? and uh, he really, she really wants Bapu to help him uh, facilitate uh, this, uh, the first rendezvous, uh, secret rendezvous that uh, Sumitra wants to have with Nama in Bapu's room. So Bapu uh, tries very hard to make Pandey, his roommate, leave his room uh, to make it available for Nama and Mitra but Nama does not end up coming uh, to the room. And so Pandey just assumes that Bapu wants to have some sexual fun with some girl, uh, but he makes up excuses and he makes him leave. But then after Nama does not appear, does not come to the room, Sumitra is very disappointed. Okay. And uh, she then later realizes or discovers that Nama is having an affair with Manya Dalvi, uh, her boyfriend. right? And um, Mitra, Sumitra wants Bapu to actually find out about uh, Dalvi and uh, Nama's affair with him. And uh, so the, the play is actually full of unrequited uh, relationships, uh, unrequited love. Uh, Pandey is in love with Sumitra, not knowing that she is lesbian. Sumitra is in love with Nama, but Nama has a boyfriend called Dalvi. And Bapu is in, lo is in love with uh, Sumitra, but he's not able to express his love for her. And later on, he dis when, when he discovers that she's lesbian, then there's nothing he can do about it. So he, he just remains a compassionate friend uh, almost till the end of the play. Later on, uh, Bapu discovers that uh, Sumitra has uh, forged his handwriting and his signature to write a threatening letter to uh, Dalvi, asking him to let go of Nama. Right? and for which Bapu is thrashed. Bapu is thrashed by, uh, by Dalvi, uh, and Bapu, of course, is innocent, but then later he discovers to his indignation that Sumitra has been writing a letter in his handwriting with a signature, and he, she posted the letter from uh, the, the, the post office where he lives. And so he is very disappointed and upset with uh, Sumitra for forging his handwriting and signature. And uh, when Bapu is thrashed, after he's thrashed uh, by uh, Dalvi, uh, Sumitra doesn't seem to be very remorseful or regretful for what she's done, right? And so the sympathy of the readers, obviously, with Bapu for having been manipulated by this woman, right? So later on, Bapu also tells uh, Pandey that uh, Mitra is lesbian. Right? After which Pandey leaves. Um, uh, he gets he's com he gets commissioned as a soldier in the Second World War, so he leaves. Um, then later on, the many other complications in second act, where Dalvi discovers uh, uh, Nama and Mitra in Bapu's room, and he takes Nama away, much to uh, Sumitra's anger and anguish. And Bapu also tries very hard to convince uh, Mitra to give up Nama, but she is stubborn and relentless. She refuses to let go of her. Bapu also has a conversation with Nama, asking her if on whose side she is on. But you know, this is at this, it's at this point when Nama tells um, Bapu. Bapu asks her, "Are you on Sumitra's side or are you on Dalvi's side?" And Nama is not able to give a very clear answer. She says, "Well, I like Mitra as a friend. I I like many things about her, but Manya Dalvi is a different matter altogether. 
I mean there is no comparison. What I mean is, I'm not able to say what I mean. The truth is, I, I think, I don't know what I mean. I'll go. Right? So she's not very clear about what she means. But later on, we realize that uh, she is uh, not uh, very happy with Sumitra. She, she, she confesses later on that she finds Sumitra's love rather suffocating and possessive. Right? And that exactly becomes the moot point of the play. That on one hand, it seems to portray a woman who has been sidelined, stigmatized, uh, you know, humiliated for her sexual orientation. But on the other hand, uh, it's also a, a comment. The play is a comment on the nature of love as a source of power and authority. Because you have a woman like Nama who's been uh, torn apart, I mean, almost being uh, possessed by both Dalvi and, um, and, uh, and Mitra, and they both compete for her attention. But in the process of competing for the same woman, uh, you also realize that there is this other side to, uh, to what these people call love, what uh, Mitra calls love especially, that uh, can become very ugly when it becomes uh, possessive and, uh, and authoritarian. Uh, and when it, when it comes with a sense of entitlement. So they're not concerned about Nama's feelings and what she wants, but they just want her for herself. Right? So it's again, love becomes a way of exercising and exerting power over somebody else. And uh, Bapu in the entire play becomes a narrator, a commentator, who on the nature of, uh, of love. I mean, he, he, he himself doesn't force himself on Sumitra. He, he understands that she's, she has. Uh, she only desires women. She. Al he also tries to facilitate um, her his rond her rendezvous with with Nama, but even though they are not successful, and uh, he is also a very good friend to her. He's compassionate and he's kind, and supportive of her, but um, she is not very uh, good to him. She she manipulates him. She's not very concerned when he he gets beaten up. He's not concerned. Uh, she's not concerned by the fact that he is the one who is being. Uh, uh, stigmatized and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, ill-treated by the other classmates because he is her friend, and so on and so forth. So it becomes rather hard because Bapu seems to be the voice of balance of sanity, right? Um, but um, because he neither stigmatizes uh, um, uh, Mitra nor does he wholeheartedly embrace her uh, her lesbianism, so it becomes. Um, uh, an interesting form uh, to have a male narrator who is not a conventional man, somebody who seems to be rather caring and maybe if not effeminate but soft and gentle, not a conventional man, but um, and and a woman who is uh, a lesbian, a very masculine lesbian woman who is not able to accept the fact that society has stigmatized and rejected her, and she is determined and at all odds to actually get what she wants, which is Nama. And um, Bapu is actually unable to convince uh, um, Mitra to give up on Nama, right? Uh, because Mitra wants uh, only Nama and she, does, she doesn't want anybody else, right? Uh, he's unable to convince her to give her up or get married. Uh, and this comes out, to, uh, it comes out in the, towards the um, end of the second act. Later on, Dalvi also wants Bapu to rent out his room to him so that she can, he can have his uh, secret rendezvous with, uh, with Nama. Right? But uh, towards the end, Bapu realizes that he doesn't want to get involved in, in either of these affairs and he only wants to give up his room and uh, move to another place where he will not be hurt. Um, or, um, and, and what also happens uh, towards the second act is, the, is, is that um, uh, he uh, he is um, he realizes that uh, that uh, that Mitra has been manipulating him, and that is when his uh, perception of her changes. And on the uh, middle of Act Three, that is where he, uh, Bapu uh, changes his perception. He says, "Suddenly, I realized I had stopped liking Mitra. I didn't want to see her. A kind of revulsion came over me. This was the first time it happened in our friendship." It had reached a breaking point. I cut short of a meeting that day. Maybe she was not aware of it. I was full of anger, more than I had ever experienced. And I didn't know what it was about. That night, I decided I would do everything possible to free Nama from Mitra's hold, to hail with Mitra. 
I didn't care any more about what she thought. Why did I get so furious? Mitra had not hurt me, not at all. And whenever she had hurt me, I had felt slightly snubbed, nothing more. I had, fe I had not felt anger. But this time, what I experienced was definitely anger. Whether it was Nama or someone else, how could anyone treat another human being as a plaything? And this is exactly what happens. This is his response after uh, he discovers from Nama that she is leaving to Calcutta to get married to another man. So she doesn't get married to uh, Dalvi. She moves to Calcutta and she gets married to, to another man. And he, uh, she asks him to promise uh, her that he will not tell anyone. But he actually ends up telling uh, Sumitra out of, out of sympathy. And when Sumitra gets to know, she rushes to uh, Calcutta to, to, to try and stop the marriage. But it does not happen. And so uh, he is very upset with Sumitra for betraying his word, her word. So she says that, and so he continues to say, um, what right had Mitra to blackmail Nama? because Mitra decides to actually emotionally blackmail Nama and, and ruin her reputation for abandoning her the second time. Close all her options and keep her for herself. How could she force Nama into loving her? In every way, it was brutal. I would not accept this kind of mania. Right? And that is when he decides to write a long letter to Pandey, who is uh, at the war front, about uh, his... Uh, his um, anger and his, uh, bit, his, his bitterness with, um, with uh, Mitra for betraying him. And so that is when his perception of um, uh, Sumitra changes. So despite the fact that Sumitra and Nama have occasional encounters and meetings, uh, we realize that uh, Sumitra is uh, only needs Nama to validate her own sense of hurt, her own sense of isolation, right? I mean, she wants to be loved and desired, but she is not a person who's willing to love someone and give them the freedom to be, uh, to be on their own, to just be, right? So uh, her love becomes very suffocating and possessive. It becomes a sense of authority. And later on, someone in the college writes a story about Mitra and for which her uh, reputation is spoiled. And then uh, she's on the verge of being rusticated by the principal from college. But Sumitra is not concerned. She just wants, she doesn't care about anyone anymore, right? You see her cycling everywhere. You see her smoking. You see her seem absolutely indifferent to anyone. And she then also tries to, uh, she constantly borrows money from uh, Bapu. Despite the fact that he has, she has not been a good friend to him, uh, he still gives her money on, and lends her money. And then uh, finally, he doesn't ask for his money back. But then uh, later on, he realizes that she needed money, despite the fact that she came from a very well-to-do family, to actually uh, uh, um, I mean, earn enough money to buy a ticket, a train ticket to go and see uh, Nama. And it's only towards the end of the play when we see uh, Mit Pandey and Dalvi and Bapu get together. Pandey has come back from the war and they get together and uh, they uh, learn from Bapu all that has happened with Sumitra. And, uh, um, you know, when Pandey, of course, is now indifferent to Sumitra when he realizes that she's a lesbian. And um, they get together and they have a drink at a club. Uh, which is meant for army officers. And there they see Sumitra uh, dressed up like in a sari, uh, dancing and drunk and performing for the uh, officers in the club. And that is where, when she's drunk, that she actually exposes her vulnerable side. And she says to the officers while she's drinking, uh, you know something? No. You should know. Bapu is a pig. He is a pig, a first-class pig. Thinks he has a right to boss me. Do this, don't do that. Don't go there, sit here thinks he is the boss, the boss. I kick him, kick him, kick the bastard. Thinks Mitra is, a, is an umbrella. No, no, a chair, a handbag. Put it down and it, and it, it will stay there. I'm not a handbag. I'm a human being. I have my will. I'll do what I like. Go to Calcutta. I'll roam this, I'll roam this searching for Nama. It doesn't matter if I don't find her. But who the bloody hell is Bapu? A pig, pig. I hate him, hate him. Then later on she says, no, I'm not a good little girl. I'm a whore, a lesbian. Do you know that? A lesbian bitch, a freak. He says, don't lie. Don't depend on me. 
wrote off the money, wrote off. Friendship is over, he said. All right, let it be over. Who, who lied? I lied? I didn't lie, not to him. I lied to my mother, but not to him. You know what? Told him what I didn't tell anyone. He, he was my mother. Mother Bapu, mother Bapu. Gone, friendship is over, Nama is over. No dependence, no dependence. Bapu, gone. Bapu is dead, dead, dead. I killed him. I, I, I. Loud, broken sobs. I killed Bapu. Cut him to pieces. I cut him to pieces. Right? So that's what she says towards the end of the play, where uh, she feels that she is uh, remorseful for what she's done to Bapu, that she has betrayed his friendship, but also the fact that now she feels finally free of all obligations. She doesn't have Nama anymore, and she has uh, nothing uh, to tie her to anyone. So she does, she does feel that, uh, that towards the end she embraces her own sense of uh, isolation and abjection and uh, she ends her life uh, this time successfully. So it, it becomes, uh, you know, she in the process of you know, having a female character who is marginalized, who, is, uh, who has a non-normative sexual orientation, who's lespian, ends up actually, uh, uh, you know, fighting social norms, but in the process, uh, you know, in the process of challenging social norms, uh, goes overboard, right? And then ends up becoming this, this manic woman who is obsessed uh, into uh, getting the woman she wants, even at the cost of hurting everyone else. Right? And uh, this is what uh, Rohini Hattangadi had to say, because the play was performed once in 1981 before it was banned. And uh, so uh, uh, this is what Rohini had to say, and she's a very fine Marathi actress. And this is what she had to say about uh, her, the, what, how she understood the role of Mitra. She played the role of Mitra. So this is what Rohini Hattangadi has to say about what she thought about her character. She says so, uh, that for many years, I had a wish, right from my college days, right from the days I had acted in plays like Ratra, Ratra and Srimant, that I wanted to act in a new play by Tendulkar, a play which nobody had done before. And then a chance came along. When I Apti was going to do Mitrachi Goshta, which is the Marathi title for a friend's story, I read the script and liked it. The subject was new and different. In the first instance, almost unpalatable. The central character of Sumitra is that of a lesbian, a chance and a challenge for any actress to play such a character. Sumitra, that is Mitra, being different is the core essence of the play. The reactions to the people around her, her friend, her lover, her lover's boyfriend, in fact Mitra's rival and the boy who is fond of Mitra, show the reactions of the society through representative characters and then the end which is inevitable. Then, in fact, Tendulkar had portrayed Mitra's character so well in the play that it was not necessary to do any extra homework. But to get a better idea, I did some reading on homosexuality and came to a broad understanding that these attractions are of two kinds, one based on circumstances and two, physical hormonal imbalance. Mitra belongs to the second category. While growing up, she looks around and realizes that she's different. She accepts it up to a point, then allows herself to flow with the stream and lets herself go. The reasons for this are her stubborn nature, her desire to do what she wants to do, social conflict, and then her rebellion. There's one person who tries to understand her, and that is Bapu. In spite of not liking her attitude, Bapu always helps her and is always beside her. Then, later on, uh, Rohini says, um, Looking at Mitra, one cannot make out her abnormality. Boys at colleges, at college, find her attractive. Pandey, who feels that he is in love with Mitra, leaves the city to join the army as soon as he comes to know through Bapu what Mitra's preferences are. Mitra is from middle class surroundings, with parents and a family. When she realizes her abnormality, she is totally disturbed. She tries to fight her own battle, and Bapu is a main support for her. When Bapu too doesn't understand her and feels that while going to Calcutta, she has gone overboard, she is angry at Bapu and at herself and breaks away from him. For Mitra, it is not breaking away from Bapu, but breaking away from herself, from her being Mitra. She tries to be feminine and cannot do it, and one day commits suicide and succeeds. The appearance of the character portrait is very important. It creates a lasting impression with the audience. So while deciding Mitra's attire, we had to take into consideration the period and the locale of the play. 
The locale is not very clear from the script, but one can forego that. About the period, one can rely on one reference. Bapu once, once mentions that Pandey went to the war somewhere in Europe, so we can take this to be World War II. As a middle class Maharashtrian, the woman's attire should be a sari. Tendulkar also had this in mind. Mitra in sari should look manly, so I kept the pallu tied tightly around my waist. The collared blouse was slightly longer, no jewellery, just a wristwatch and a shabnam bag hanging from the shoulder. The colour of the sari was off-white. After meeting Nama, it would be pinkish. Sometimes I would be smoking a cigarette. I remember I had never smoked in my life before, but Mitra had this habit, so I had to learn. Smoking on stage is difficult, particularly if you do not smoke. It looks fake when you just take smoke in the mouth and let it out. Mitra had to look like a habitual smoker. Not that I had to, but I started practicing right from day one of the rehearsals. Slowly I got the hang of it. I learned to release the smoke while talking. I used my hands to show Mitra's restlessness. Standing with hands folded across the chest, looked manly and showed her closed mind. I don't know how, but one mannerism evolved during rehearsals. Rubbing the elbow of one hand with the palm of the other hand. It looked all right, so I continued with it later. I used to make it more vigorous as the restlessness increased. While rehearsing for the play, I had an amusing experience. To go for the rehearsals, I had to travel by local train in Mumbai. I used to like standing at the door, feeling the wind against the face, my face. One day, while traveling, a eunuch boarded the train. There was not much of, much of a rush. The train stopped at the next station. A few ladies got down and a few entered. They looked strangely at the eunuch. I was watching them and the look on their faces. Isn't Mitra also different? That look on their faces said so many things to me. From that day onwards, Mitra came closer to me still. While reading Mitra Chigoshta one day, one feels that if the references to the time in the play are deleted, the play is of today, because things have not changed much in the past few years for a different person. Different in quotes. Tendulkar wrote this play seven or eight years before we actually staged it, maybe earlier. In those days, nobody talked about these things openly let alone put up a play on the subject. Even when we performed it, it was labelled as a bold subject. Or what sort of subject is it? It did not run too well as a commercial play, but those who saw our performance still remember it, I remember it as an unforgettable experience. Right? So this is what Rohini Hatangari has to say about her character of Sumitra and how she began to acquire certain habits on stage, like smoking or rubbing her elbow with her palm or, or folding her arms across her chest to uh, give her uh, a masculine uh, demeanor and appearance. Right. So uh, this is our discussion of um, a friend's story. And in the next session, we'll be discussing another very famous uh, and well-known uh, play by uh, Vijay Tendulkar, which is Ghashiram Kotwal. Thank you.